Hello and welcome to another episode of uh, Saga Stories with the Reykjavik Grapevine. My name is Dr. Matthew Roby and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Iceland. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about Flower Manor Saga. Uh, and in order to tell that story, we're here about 15 kilometers south of the modern day town of Selfoss, uh, near to the uh, farmstead where the hero of Flower Manor Saga, Flower Manor Saga lived. Uh, that's the farmstead of Traverholt, and his name is Thorgils. <laughs> Flow Manor Saga is very interesting for a number of reasons. Um, one of those is that it blends tropes from a number of different genres, including legendary sagas and saints' lives. Um, but also the plot itself is very interesting. Uh, the plot uh, centers on the um, sort of Odyssey-like story, an Odyssey-like journey uh, to Greenland uh, of the hero, Thorgils. And its main conflict centers around his trials and the, the testing of his nascent Christianity. Uh, he, he's constantly uh, tempted to, to go back to paganism. Um, so, th as I said, Thorgils was born at the farm Tratherholt, which is somewhere around here, um, and lived there when he was growing up. Uh, like many saga heroes, Thorgils goes to continental Scandinavia as a young man on a, an adventure where he kills ghosts and defeats bandits and wins renown. Uh, and then he comes back to Iceland, uh, and returns to the farm at Tratherholt, uh, which he takes up ownership with, along with his brother, uh, takes a wife, uh, an Icelandic woman named Thore, um, and then settles down here. Now, shortly after his arrival uh, back in Iceland, uh, Thorgils is one of the first Icelanders to accept Christianity when it came around the year 1000. Uh, after he's accepted Christianity, one night when he's sleeping, at Tratherholt, he has a, a threatening dream. The god Thor, the pagan god Thor, comes to him in a dream and threatens him and demands that he return back to the pagan faith. But Thorgils remains resolute and says he's now put his faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and so Thorgils uh, wakes up the next morning to find that his fattened boar, one of the pigs that he kept on his farm, has been has died overnight mysteriously. Um, now, Thorgils makes sure that nobody uh, uses the animal for meat because he senses that it might have been cursed by the god Thor and he takes the boar uh, and buries it on an abandoned area uh, somewhere on the farm. Um, but he continues to have these bad dreams where he's visited by Thor who, uh, who threatens him or encourages him to retake up his uh, old pagan faith. Um, and uh, when he wakes up from these dreams, he sometimes finds that more of his livestock have been killed. So one night he decides to stay up overnight and go out to where the livestock are and lie in wait. And the saga, rather characteristically for a saga, doesn't tell us exactly what happened because only Thorgils was there. But it says that when he returned to the farm, people saw that he was all bruised, his body was black and blue. Um, and it seemed like he had wrestled somebody. And the saga says the people at the farm thought he must have wrestled the god Thor who was attacking his livestock. Um, now after that point, the killings of the livestock do end. So the saga perhaps implies that Thorgils, uh, with the strength of his new Christian faith, has actually defeated the god Thor in this wrestling match. Um, but as it turns out, this isn't the end of Thorgils' troubles uh, 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 arising from his recent Christianization. And in fact, the rest of the saga outlines the trials and tribulations that he goes through where his new Christian faith is tested and put to the limit. Now, as is told in numerous other sagas, most notably the, the Vinland sagas, that's Grindlendinger saga and Erik saga Reuther, around this time, around the year 1000, uh, this is when Erik the Red, Eriker Reuvi, um, is establishing his settlements in Greenland. Um, and word comes here to Tratherholt, to Thorgils, that Erika would like him to come to Greenland and join the settlement. Before they leave on this journey, uh, Thorgils continues to have threatening dreams uh, of the god Thor, and his wife Thore 
uh, predicts that the journey to Greenland will go very badly if they take it, um, but Thorgils uh, decides to go anyway. And this is just one of many examples in the sagas um, where women prove to, to be wiser, um, usually wiser at predicting things, wiser at interpreting dreams, um, but often they're ignored. Uh, by the men who, who, may, who make the decisions. Um, so once they set off uh, from the coast of Iceland and head towards Greenland, they start to have bad weather. First, the wind dies down altogether and they're just adri adrift at sea uh, for a long time. Um, and their provisions and their fresh water supplies start to run out. Um, and all this time, uh, Thorgils' hungry and desperate crew, and also the god Thor who keeps visiting him in dreams, they keep uh, trying to tempt him to go back to his pagan religion. The crew are urging him to pray to Thor to end this bad weather and take them to Greenland safely. And Thor, in the dreams, is telling Thorgils that if he gives up his Christianity and goes back to paganism, um, he will protect the journey. Um, but Thorgils continues to remain resolute in his new Christianity. Um, and so they're, they're having various storms on the way to Greenland. And Thorgils realizes one day that one of the cows that they brought with them on the boat, back when he was a pagan, he had dedicated this cow uh, to Thor. Um, and he thinks this might be the cause of their troubles. So against the protestations of his increasingly hungry crew, one day Thorgils throws this cow overboard. Um, and they do shortly after make land in Greenland, but their troubles are far from over because they are shipwrecked on an inhospitable coast, uh, quite far from the human settlement that they were trying to reach, uh, and the winter is just coming on. Uh, so they end up on this inhospitable shoreline. The sea is uh, enclosing them with ice, so they can't go anywhere uh, by sea, and the ship itself has broken apart. Luckily, all of the people survived, and they were able to survive. To, to um, they were able to save the small rowing boat off the ship, but the ship itself is destroyed. Um, so they're able to make a hut out of driftwood, some of the sh pieces of the ship that wash up, and they live on this inhospitable coastline in this hut for uh, two years apparently and they experience a lot of bad things while they are there. Obviously they're battling the elements and they're battling hunger, they're, they only manage to survive by hunting and fishing. Um, and at one point Thorgils even has to fight with some troll women for some whale meat that's washed up on the shore in a scene that's quite reminiscent from the legendary sagas. Uh, and also during this time, there is a plague of haunting and sickness and death that attacks his crew living in this hut. And this is uh, implied in the saga to be related to the lingering paganism of some members of his crew. It's the pagans who, who, who die and come back as ghosts. Uh, now, at some point during this time while they're, they're living on this uh, inhospitable coastline on Greenland, Thore, Thorgils' wife, gives birth to a young boy that they name Thorfinnur. Um, but because they don't have very much food, uh, Thore finds it hard to recover her strength. And the, and the boy, of course, is, is, is also uh, struggling to survive. He's only a newborn. Uh, and at one point, Thore, uh, Thorgils' wife, implores her husband to go and try and find a way out of this mess. Um, so reluctantly, because he doesn't trust some of the members of his crew, he does leave. He goes and climbs a glacier to try and see if they can find a way out. Um, but unfortunately, when he returns to the hut, he finds uh, his crew gone, the rowing boat stolen, all of the provisions stolen, and his wife has been stabbed, murdered. He finds her body in the hut and he finds his young newborn son Thorfinn trying to breastfeed uh, uh, at the breast of, of his dead wife. So this obviously upsets Thorgils very deeply um, and he's fearing for the life of his young son Thorfinn uh, because obviously he needs sustenance to survive. And so in a scene which is more reminiscent of a miracle in a saint's life than anything in, a, in an Icelandic family saga, Thorgils decides that he has to breastfeed his own son. He does this by cutting open his nipple and according to the saga, first blood came out, then a mixture of blood and milk and finally just milk came out. Uh, and in this act, Thorgils is able to keep Thorfinnur alive. Um, uh, now, I mentioned in previous episodes when we were talking about Ulkovra saga at Thingvetlir, um, 
that the sagas do contain lots of uh, insults that use gendered uh, and, and sexual terms to try and insult people. But of course here in Flower Manor Saga we see an instance where gender bending, a man doing something that's obviously uh, fundamentally a, a female act, breastfeeding a child, is portrayed very positively. It, it shows his deep emotional connection to the boy and his will to survive. And of course it's miraculous on top of that. Um, and the little boy Thorfinn too embodies some uh, features that are common to religious literature and saints' lives. He embodies the trope of the puer senex, which means the wise little boy, or literally it means the old child, uh, the old little boy. Um, and he does this by being prodigious and precocious. Uh, but unlike the prodigious eight that we spoke about in a previous episode, Thorfinn's prodigiousness is in his morality. He is eloquent at speaking, but he's very stoic and moral and wise. Um, and this is shown, they do actually set off in, in a boat that they make out of hides and try and get to a human settlement. And while they're rowing, they come across a seagull's egg, which they give to the boy. And Thorfinn, who is only a baby at the time, refuses to eat all of it. And they ask him why, and he says, well, I can see that you don't have enough to eat. So it's only right that I shouldn't have enough to eat as well. Uh, so he refuses to eat the second half of this seagull egg. And then rather amusingly, when they do get to a human settlement, Thorfinner is given to some of the women there to breastfeed. Um, and Thorfinner uh, comments after breastfeeding that their milk is very different from his father's milk. Um, and so, as you can see, in this saga we get a lot of tropes that are quite miraculous uh, and are reminiscent of uh, uh, Christian literature um, and especially uh, miracle stories and saints' lives. So eventually, Thorgils and his crew do make it to the settlement of Erik Roivi in Greenland, um, but they're not treated very well there. Uh, and, and it seems like this is implicitly because of a conflict between Erik Roivi's uh, paganism and Thorgils' Christianity. Uh, and so after staying there for a short while, they do end up leaving um, and they set off out to sea again, Thorgils, his son Thorfinnur and their small crew. And they have many adventures at sea, uh, but eventually they arrive within sight of Iceland again. Um, they apparently see Hjörleif's Hövdi and they are trying to make land, but then another great storm comes up uh, and casts them out back to sea just off the coast of Iceland. And apparently uh, Thorgils himself is bailing water out of the boat for two full days straight. At one point, a, a huge wave comes and washes over the boat. Um, now, Thorfinner, the young boy, is sitting on his father's lap, and the wave is strong enough that it washes Thorfinner straight out of the boat. Um, and then shortly after that, another huge wave comes the other way and washes Thorfinner back in. Um, and Thorfinner, still embodying this puer senex trope from uh, the saints' lives, uh, still showing his great eloquence and great stoicism, all the little boy says, he looks up at his father and he says, the surges of the sea are strong, father. And shortly afterwards, the young boy starts to cough up blood and eventually dies from, from being washed, washed off the boat. Um, now Thorgils is absolutely distraught about this and he clings on to the body and refuses to let go. Uh, now when the storm dies down, uh, they do actually make land somewhere around Hjörleifshövdi, uh, somewhere under Eyjafjallajökull, probably about 80 kilometres east of Traðarholt. Um, and there's a church there, and so Thorgils' crew want to make sure that Thorfinner is buried. But as I said, Thorgils is clinging onto the body, he doesn't want to let go of it. Um, and so his crew devise a plan to lure Thorgils away while they bury the body. They take advantage of Thorgils' heroic nature and his helpful nature. They, they pretend to get into a fight with one of the locals, and they say, Thorgils, we need your help um, to, to, in, in this fight. So Thorgils drops the body and goes and helps them, and while he's doing that, and Another member of his crew picks up Thorfinn, takes him to the church there and buries him. Now when Thorgils finds out about this, he's uh, enraged for quite some time. But after he calms down, he realises uh, probably it was the best thing to do to bury Thor Thorfinn. Um, and he utters a very significant line. He says he would no longer blame women for loving the children that they breastfed the most. So obviously um, a reference to his previous breastfeeding of Thorfinn and showing his deep emotion and his deep love for his son. 
Now, after that, Thorgils returns back to Tratherholt um, and lives there for quite a long time, in fact, until he's 85. He has another wife uh, and several more children, from one of whom is descended Bishop Thorlaukur, the patron saint of Iceland. Now, when Thorgils is 85, he attends a feast at Hjatli. That's where we are now. Um, this is Hjatla Kirkja or Hjatli Church, um, and Thorgils falls ill while he's at this feast and he dies. Um, and it is the saga says that he was buried at the church at Hjatli. Now, although this is not the medieval church, this is a 20th century church, but if the saga has any historical uh, truth, Thorgils' bones must be interred somewhere around here at the farmstead of Hjatli. Um, now, the holiness of Thorgils' descendants, especially Bishop Thorlaukur, obviously shows um, that all of his trials through which he maintained his Christianity and resisted the temptation to go back to paganism, uh, shows that ultimately his trials were rewarded and that Christianity finally won out over paganism. So that's it from another episode of the Reykjavik Grapevine Saga Stories. I hope you enjoyed these tales from Floa Manor Saga from here on a very cold uh, day in South Iceland. Uh, if you did like it, please remember to like, comment and subscribe below. And we hope you'll join us again for more saga stories in the future. I'm Dr. Matthew Roby from the University of Iceland and thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.